Very happy to be with each of you here this evening, especially as we open the Word of God. Tonight we have a very important study, specifically dealing with prophets. If you think about the beginning of this world, in the very beginning of this world's history, you take a look at Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and they were able to talk with God face to face. But you know something happened. When sin entered in, man could not communicate with God directly. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, it tells us God's desire to communicate with you. Did you know that? God wants to talk to you. And it says in Hebrews 1 verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So because God cannot communicate directly with us, He doesn't want to stop communication, so what does He do? He introduces individuals called prophets. And what God does, He speaks through the prophets in order to reach you and to be able to communicate with you. But you know, as time went by, God says that's not enough. It's not enough to speak through someone else. And in verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 11 it says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He had appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. What happened? After 4,000 years of speaking through us, to us through prophets, God became flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. And God walked this world and God wanted to talk to us directly. Isn't that wonderful? And this is how God came. Now, when we talk about God speaking through us, through Jesus Christ, we talk about God speaking to us through the Gospel. So, when you want to know what God had to directly say, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That is the description of what Jesus said while He was on this earth. But you know what? When we think about those four Gospels, was that the intention of God, that that was all He had to say to us directly? No. Let's look at John 14, verse 16. As Jesus was about to be crucified, keep in mind that this is John chapter 14. John 13 is a foot washing service. That means the next day, Jesus is crucified. So between the foot washing service and the crucifixion, what happened? It says here, Jesus had a prayer. He says, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Can you imagine? Here are these disciples thinking, Jesus is about ready to go away. He's going to be gone. We have been with Him. Of course, they didn't quite understand all that right now. They still hope that He's going to stick around a little bit longer. But Jesus says, Look, I know you need a comforter. And guess what? I'm going to send you another one. Now, what is the purpose of this another comforter? What was he going to do? In verse 26, John 14, verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So what's the purpose of the comforter? To do what? Teach what? If you notice here, it's to give more information. Did you know that? Teaching, the act of teaching is to give more information. More information that Jesus gave? Yes. That's what teaching means. It means there, even though Jesus spent three and a half years teaching in this world, there was more information He wanted to give to us. And in that more information, He says, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost and He is going to give you that more information, that teaching. And also bring to your remembrance some things that you have forgotten. Now, what is included in this all teachings? In John 15, the next chapter, verse 26, it says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, which proceeded from the Father, He shall do what? Testify of whom? Of me. 
So that means when Jesus left this world, the Holy Spirit comes back to this world to do what? To testify of Jesus Christ. That is His work that is going to be there. Now, why? When Jesus was in this world, it says in John chapter 16, so here it is getting closer to the crucifixion. You see. Now, in John chapter 16, verse 7, to get the context, and then verse 12 is the one I want to emphasize. Verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. It is good for you. It is necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Why will not the Comforter come unto you if I'm still around? Why not? Because they had Jesus. They didn't need anyone else. <laughs> they had no need. But now, when Jesus goes away, they need a comforter. And now notice verse 12. It says, I have yet what? This is chapter 16. Stop and think. This is just before the crucifixion. Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You cannot handle it. You cannot understand it. There's more things that you need to understand, but I, I can't reveal that to you right now. So, if Jesus could not reveal more things to them, but He wanted to reveal more things, does that mean when Jesus died, that that's the end of communication with us? No. You see, John 16, 13 and 14, Jesus has another way of communication. In John 16, 13 to 14, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come... He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself. But whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. And He will show you things to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall receive of Mine and shall show it unto you. The purpose of the Holy Ghost was to reveal more things. For this reason, the disciples, after the crucifixion, they wanted to go out Share something with the world. Jesus told them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Right? That's what He told the disciples. But did you know something what He told them before that? Before He said, Go into all the world, He said, Wait. You're not ready to go. Sometimes we're eager to go, aren't we? God wants to say something. We're ready to run. Let's do this. Let's do that. But sometimes we have to wait. And what do they have to wait for? In Luke 24, verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. And tarry ye, in other words, wait, and tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. You see, sometimes we're so eager to go to work. But sometimes we need to wait until we receive that power. <coughs> When the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost, we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, their actual experience. What happened to them in fulfillment of the Holy Ghost coming? What happened? It says, but this is that, this is Apostle Peter explaining some things, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my Spirit. And they shall prophesy. In other words, when the Holy Spirit came, how did He begin communicating with the people. Through what? Through prophets. So stop and think for a moment. From the, with the time that sin entered into this world, in the time of Adam and Eve, until Jesus Christ, God spoke to humanity through prophets. Right? Then after Jesus left this world, because while He was here, it was God manifested in the flesh, spake directly. Then after He left, what happened? 
he reintroduced the gift of prophecy. Who introduced this gift of prophecy? Who, in, who introduced it? Christ did through the Holy Spirit. Right? So the spirit of prophets through men and women was once again reintroduced. Now, in verse 17 that we just read a few moments ago, I want you to pay attention. This gift of prophecy, notice what it says here in verse 17. It shall come to pass in the what? So, although partially it was fulfilled in the time of the apostles, yet this prophecy actually shows that in the last days of this earth's history, God will once again have what? Prophets. Well, that's a very important statement here. So from this we can see that the gift of the Spirit will be in the church how long? Till the end of time. It was not designed just to be until the last apostle died, but was to be till the end of time. <coughs> so when we talk about the promises of God, For the church, till the very end of time. Does that include the gift of prophecy? How do we identify true prophets from the false? What specific rules can we safely follow in this testing process? This is a very important question. Because there's many prophets. I've run into quite a few individuals over the years who claim to be prophets. Yes, they told me, we are prophets. I am a prophet and you need to listen to me. And uh, in the process of time, I found out that they were prophets. Yeah, they were prophets. And they asked me, do you believe I'm a prophet? I said, yes, I believe. You see, in the Bible, there's two kinds of prophets. There's the true, and there's the false. And unfortunately, in your case, based on the testing prophets, it's false. So let's take a look at this. Because it's very important for us. Because we're going to meet many different individuals in this world. And we have to be very clear on what is true and what is false. But before we go to the tests, I want to talk a little bit more about the gift of prophecy itself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, we find the experience of Apostle Paul talking to the church in Corinth. He says, so that ye come behind in what? No gift. He doesn't want, he says, to this church here, I don't want you to be behind in any gift. Waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that until the coming of Jesus Christ, He does not want us to be lacking gifts. Right? In the church. And in the church we need all the gifts. Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as Apostle Paul says to this church, I don't want you lacking in any gifts until the day of Jesus Christ. What gift does he specifically mention? Notice the previous verse, because this is verse 7 and 8. And now, let's go to verse 4 to 6. I think that will give the context, right? So, which gifts are we not to be lacking in to the coming of Jesus Christ? It says here, I thank my God always on your behalf. For the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by Him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So what was confirmed in the believers in Corinth? The testimony of Christ. Now what's another word for Christ? Jesus, right? So what was going on? They had... The testimony of Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Now, in Revelation chapter 12, as we go through the great period of the dark ages that was prophesied both in Matthew and then you find it in chapter 12, there were two things that were there to identify the remnant church. You know, there's so many things that people say about each other. How many people say, we are the remnant? Yeah, we are the remnant. And someone once even came and told me, they said, Peter, you all think you are the remnant church? 
<laughs> tell them, well, you know what? If I didn't think this is the remnant church, I'd be somewhere else. Quite obviously, everyone thinks they are the remnant church. However, thinking we are the remnant church does not make us the remnant church. Because the Bible does not say such and such is the remnant church. The Bible identifies the remnant church by certain characteristics. And in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with whom? With a remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't have time to go through this study here in the context of Revelation 12, but you find three groups here that the, the, the dragon is not very happy with. Who are they? Number one is whom? The woman. And number two is the remnant of her seed. Number three is? No, that's what they have. That's the, the, the three people, the groups of people. Let's go back to keep people. Let's go back to groups of people. Who are they? You have the woman. Now, by the way, if you have the remnant of her seed, what else do you have? You have the seed. All right, so here's the three. You have the woman, you have the seed, and you have the remnant of her seed. Now, this remnant of her seed, right? Is that clear? So now, in this remnant of her seed, he makes war, not with all, everyone, but with a remnant of her seed. Now, why is he so angry to make war with a remnant of her seed? What do they possess? They actually keep the commandments of God. And they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what, they, that's what it is. So the remnant church in the last days that gets the devil so angry that he makes war with her is because these people keep the commandments of God and they have something that is called the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now what is this testimony of Jesus Christ? We go to Revelation 19 and verse 10. Very simple. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You understand this? This means that this remnant, whoever they are, that doesn't identify it by name, but whoever they are, they're going to be a people that actually keep the commandments of God. And they're going to ha be a people that what? That have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you a question. If I'm holding the Bible and I put it here in my hand, do I have the Bible in this context? <laughs> no. Possessing this book does not mean I have it. Many people have this book. This book is still the most published book in the world. Does that mean everyone has this book? No. You can not only, nowadays not only publish, you have it on your computers, you have it on your cell phones. And you've got this Bible everywhere. It does not mean I have it. So, there's more to this than just as it, as it seems. And we'll get to that tomorrow in our last study. Yes, tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock, we're going to cover a little bit more on what it means to have it. But let us go a little bit further here. Because we need to understand the purpose of the gift of the Spirit, especially the gift of prophecy. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, and then we'll go to verse 4 and 5. It says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Right? Christ is coming like what? Like a thief in the night. To whom? Notice here verse 4. But ye brethren... 
He says, here's a group of people that comes as a thief, but you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So here is a group of people that Jesus does not come as a thief. Why? Because they're in the light. They are not in the darkness. Now, what is specifically asked of the children of light? Same chapter. Same chapter. Down a little bit further, verse 19 to 21. What God expects from those who are in the light is, first of all, verse 19, quench not the spirit. What does it mean to quench? Quench means there's a fire going, and what do you do it? You quench it. You put it out. So it says, quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So here's a list of things that we need to be doing. And the context of these verses is the last days, isn't it? Because the first one is talking about the coming of Christ again. Now, when we read these spies not prophesying, what do we mean? In Greenfield, in his Greek lexicon, gives as the meaning of the word prophesying as the exercise of of the gift of prophecy. In other words, what? Despise not the exercise of the gift of prophecy. And what is the major problem today? The big problem today is that people in the world despise the gift of prophecy. And we'll get to what we mean by the spirit of prophecy in a few minutes. So now, what kind of problems are we going to face in these last days that we actually have to test prophets? Notice Isaiah 8, verse 16. In Isaiah 8, it talks about the law of God. Verse 16 says, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. So again, the issue is what? The commandments of God. Right? That's an issue again. Now, what happens during this time when God says we need to keep the commandments? People in the world want communication with God. Did you know that? They want communication from the other side. So what do they do? There are seances. There's always looking for some way to communicate with the other side. And now notice verse 19. It says, And when they say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? In other words, people are going to the dead to wizards that peep and that mutter. I remember quite a few years ago when I was living in Temple Hills, Maryland. It's up the road from here. And we were beginning the church there. It was in its infancy. We bought the building there. And we were remodeling it, getting it ready for church services. And while I was working there, building and working on that uh, project there, I met these two ladies that used to walk up and down the street for a nice walk in the evening, sometime in the morning. And sometimes I'll be caught out there working and I'd have a nice chat with them. And uh, they invited me to come to their church. And I thought that might be a good possibility. And they said, please come tonight. I said, why? Because we're going to have someone healed there. Hmm, interesting. I didn't know God makes appointments for healings. Usually he sees someone in need and heals them. But such an appointment, I said, well, you know, I think I'll pass this time. Anyway, some months later, I was out working again on the yard. I was putting in the uh, shrubs to, at the, at the uh, edge of the property. And as we were digging the holes, this lady came by, the older lady came by. And she began again telling me I need to come to their church. 
And uh, on one occasion, just before that, actually, before I get to this, she asked me, Peter, does your church believe in the Holy Spirit? I said, yes, we believe. I said, wow. She said, not many people believe in the Holy Spirit today. She says to me, Peter, does your church believe in speaking in tongues? I said, yes, we believe in speaking in tongues. I said, wow, there's really not many churches believe in speaking in tongues. She says, Peter, do you speak in tongues? I said, yes, I speak in two of them. <laughs> what do you mean, two of them? She said, yeah, English and Yugoslav. I speak two of them. She said, well, anyway, they left me alone. But on this occasion, as I was working there by the shrubs, the older lady was walking by herself and she came to me again and uh, she began talking to me. And she began insisting that I come to church and I need to speak in tongues. And I told her, you know, there is a Bible verse that talks about wizards peeping and muttering. But it says, you know, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to them, if there's no light in them. And you know, for the first time in my life, I observed something strange. I saw this woman doing something with her hands. And began doing something and something. And after a few minutes, I heard peeping and muttering. Exactly that started coming out of her mouth. And I said, you can say what you'd like, but the verse is very clear. If to the law and to the testimony. And if you're not keeping the law, there is no light in them. And I walked back on the church property. Anyway, she stopped. Uh, that thing that came out of her, and never again did they walk past. But you know, this verse is very important. I never heard peeping and muttering before. But this time, I heard exactly this. And what is it? People are trying to communicate with the other side. But you know, God has a way of communication. God wants to talk to you. But not through peeping and muttering. Not to the dead. So, for that reason, we need to look to God for guidance. So there are some rules in the Bible laid out in regards to prophets. What is a true prophet and what is a false prophet? Now, there are seven tests of a true prophet that we want to consider. But tonight we're only going to cover five. Because our time is a little bit limited. And the last two are so important, I need to spend a bit more time on it. And we'll do that tomorrow morning, okay? So we want to cover that tomorrow. But let's take the first one. The very first test. Now, it's not just one of the seven. It is what? All seven tests. So the first one is, we'll read it, and then we'll look at the Bible verses. All communication from God must be in harmony with His written word and the Ten Commandments. Very simple. Must be in harmony with the written word. Notice in Isaiah 8, 20. We read Isaiah 8, 19 a few moments ago, right? That was the one that peeping and muttering and, and going to the dead and all these type of things. But the very next verse says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is what? No light in them. Zero. Not a little bit. A couple of years ago, I met a man, and he was telling me about some doctrinal things that he was understanding, and uh, he said, you know, it'll really help you to read this book. And he took this book, and he says, I want you to read this book here. He says, I found some very good things in there. And then he said, oh, I know that most of it is error, but you know, there are some really good things inside there. I said, well, you know what? If you yourself identify that most of it is there, I'm not going to spend any time with it. Sorry, I'm kind of busy to go digging in the rubbish bin for some good food. I'm sure that in the rubbish bin you can find some good food. I'm sure you can do that. Okay, but why go to the rubbish bin when you have a produce bin that's fresh? Why would you do that? You wouldn't. And so it says here, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this, it is because there is what? Zero light in them. So, if you're going to tell me this is a whole bunch of error, and there may be some truth, then I'm going to tell you, I don't need to read it. Don't need it. Uh, especially when we're talking about prophets. 
Sometimes we as ministers may write a few things down and in our lack of understanding certain things may make a few mistakes. Okay, that, that's always possible. But when we're talking about prophets, it has to be pure. That's what we're talking about here. Now, especially in us, with, when we talk about Adventism, in Adventism, we talk about Ellen G. White. Now, when we say the spirit of prophecy, we are not limiting it to Ellen G. White. You see, when it read there, the law and the testimony, or the spirit of prophecy, we have... In this Bible, there is one place in which you find that something here is not given by inspiration of God. Did you know that? Did you know that? You did not know that? There is a place in this Bible that was not inspired by God. Can you imagine that? And that part is the most important part. What is it? The law of God. You see, inspiration means he inspires a prophet, right? Now, there was one part that was so important that God did not inspire a prophet. What did he do? Wrote it himself. <laughs> you see, that's the most important. He wrote the Ten Commandments itself, and not on a piece of paper, but on stone. So look, this is important. This is very important. Now, that is what you find as the law. Sometimes the law refers to the first five books of Moses as well. The first five books of the Bible. But the rest of this is what? And what is it called then? The spirit of prophecy. Absolutely. And the rest of it is the spirit of prophecy. It's the writings of the prophets. That's what we're talking about when we speak about the spirit of prophecy. So primarily it was right here, and then it is talking about prophets. So when we're talking about the spirit of prophecy, yes, it includes the writing of the prophets in the Bible. But then also we talk about, as we've noticed earlier, that the spirit of prophecy does not stop. It must continue further, isn't it? And so now we have a... Uh, a person who claimed to be a prophet. Now, what happens when you have a living prophet? A living prophet, you have to test them all the time. Did you know that? Yeah. Balaam was once a true prophet. And there were others in the Bible who were once true prophets and then they apostatized. So you have to keep testing. But when a prophet dies, what then? Then everything is there. And you can now determine whether they were a faithful prophet all their life or not. Very simple. Now, Ellen G. White, Sister White now, is in the grave for nearly 100 years. She's been in the grave. That means we have ample time to do what? To test and see, was this a prophet of God or not? Once you identify it is, then we have to consider that. And we'll, we'll get to the, the relationship later on. So now, when you read her writings, her instructions came not to give new revelations to take the place of the Bible. No prophet like when Isaiah came. Isaiah did not come to take the place of Moses. Did he? No. Okay. So now, let's take a look at one statement that she writes about herself of her own writings. In volume 5, Testament for the Church, page 663. The Word of God is sufficient to enlighten the most beclouded mind and may be understood by those who have any desire to understand it. But notwithstanding all this, some who profess to make the Word of God their study are found living in direct opposition to its plainest teachings. Then, oh, isn't this God so loving? Then, to leave men and women without excuse, God gives them plain and pointed testimonies, bringing them back to the word that they have neglected to follow. So what's the purpose of the testimonies? We go our own way, do our own things, we go away from the Bible, and what happens? Then God gives us plainer things, simpler things to understand, pointing us right back to what? To the word of God. 
That's the purpose of her writing. Does she bring additional truth? Volume 5, 665. Additional truth is not brought out. But God has, through the testimonies, simplified the great truths already given, and in His own chosen way brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them that all may be left without excuse. God wants to save every one of us. That's His purpose. So what happened? When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, what happened? They could not understand some simple things. So God says, let me make it plainer. And when they could not understand it, He says, you know what? I'm going to make you a sanctuary so you can see the whole picture in front of you. I want to really make it simple for you to understand. That's what God wants to do all the time, making it clear. When they read in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, they think, well, I didn't kill anybody. So God writes down there a little bit more in one of the other prophets and says, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. Killing is not just taking life, but it's also the act of hatred. So what happens is the spirit of prophecy keeps making things simpler and clearer to show the consistency of the Word of God. So now what happens if you decide, oh, I'm going to only hold to the Ten Commandments that says, Thou shalt not kill. And I'm not going to accept this prophet over here that says, uh, hatred is the same as murder. What happens then? then I'm rejecting God. Because still, it's a violation of that principle that is involved. Furthermore, one more statement, 663, volume 5, paragraph 2. The testimonies are not to belittle the Word of God, but to exalt it and attract minds to it, that the beautiful simplicity of truth may impress all. That's the purpose of the spirit of prophecy. And I tell you, as I've been reading the writings of Ellen G. White, I've been reading my Bible and understanding it like I've never understood it before. So let's go to point number two. That was point number one. Point number one is, once again, it is that any modern prophet must be consistent with the Ten Commandments and the writings of the other prophets. Now, number two. Can we indiscriminately believe everyone who uses the name of Jesus? Let's take a look at this one here for a moment. First John 4, 1 to 3. It's a very important Bible verse. Often misunderstood Bible verse. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So what's the problem? False prophets. So in other words, this is a test for what? Test for what? For prophets. For true prophets. And what is the test? Notice verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus is Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already in the, is in the world. So here it talks about the Antichrist. And what is the Antichrist? The, now, let me ask you a question. Is the spirit of Antichrist the spirit that does not believe that Jesus came in the flesh? Is that the spirit of Antichrist? So, if someone says, I do not believe Jesus came in the flesh, is that what it's saying? Or a little bit more then. Uh, let's just understand this thing. So if I believe that Jesus came in the flesh, am I of God? Huh? I, I, I want us to understand this a little bit here. You see, let me just go back a bit here. I want us to go back. Verse 2 is that question. It says here, does it say here, that every spirit that confesseth that Jesus came in the flesh is of God. Is that what it says? I want to ask you a question. Do we get the word came out of this? What does the word came mean? Past tense. And what does this say? Oh, not past tense. Because everyone believes Jesus came in the flesh. The Muslims believe Jesus came in the flesh. Come on. 
Does that make them of God? No. But it says here what? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Now, I want us to evaluate this a little bit more. It's interesting as I look in my um, Bible works in the uh, concordance in my computer there. It says here, for the is come, is the middle voice of a primary ver verb used only in the present and imperfect tense. Never in the past tense. So, it's not talking about Jesus came, because almost everyone believes Jesus came. Almost everyone believes Jesus came in the flesh. Now, there, there are people that don't believe Jesus came in the flesh. Okay, I understand that. But the majority of Christians don't believe Jesus walked in this earth as a human being. That doesn't make them of God. So what is it? Let's take a look a little bit here. You see, what is the purpose of the gospel? Is the purpose of the gospel for you to believe that Jesus came 2,000 years ago? Is that the purpose of the gospel? Let's take a look at the purpose of the gospel. Ephesians 3.17 That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. When? 2,000 years ago or right now? So we're talking about a present indwelling Christ. That's what we're talking about here. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye may be rooted and grounded in love today. It's not enough to believe what happened 2,000 years ago. That's a history lesson. The purpose of the gospel and the purpose of studying history is so that we can have Christ in our hearts when? Right now. This is why it's insufficient for salvation to believe that Jesus existed. That's not enough. What do we need? Notice Colossians 1.27. This is really beautiful of what we need to believe. It says here, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And what's the mystery among the Gentiles? Christ where? In you, the hope of glory. That's the indwelling Christ, isn't it? This is not just some theory. It's not just talking about that Christ came and lived in this world and went to heaven. That's it. No, it's the belief that Christ has to be in us. If you and I want to be saved, we must have an indwelling Christ right here and right now. And the indwelling Savior through the Holy Spirit is clear as you write, read the writings of the sister Ellen G. White. It's very clear. And especially if you want to see a real condensed version of understanding in her writing that Christ is come in you, read Steps to Christ. Very simple. It's not enough to believe something happened. We must believe in a present Christ indwelling in us. Now, that's quite different. Because if you believe in Christ dwelling in us, then the life that we live is whose life? Is Christ's life. And what kind of life did He live? So, if we're not living a perfect life, do we have an indwelling Christ? It's mm -hmm. an important point there. Yes, that means when I sin, what, do, what has happened? I've lost my connection and I need to come back to the Lord. Not just say, well, that's just natural. I'm just human. That's just my nature. Now, that may be your nature, but your nature needs to be changed. If you want to go to heaven, we need to change nature. So, that clear number two? All right. So, number three now. Number three is another very important point. In the third rule, we're going to evaluate the major issue with false prophets, for example. What do false prophets cater for? First John 4, verse 5. Very simple. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Very simple. When I used to live in Maryland, Washington, D.C., I'd sit there and uh, pass some of the churches, and they have prophet so-and-so speaking today. Oh, prophet, big church, prophet so-and-so, they have a prophet, everything else, you know, and in front of the church, he parks his big, nice Cadillac sitting over there, you know. In front of the door, mind you. So when you go to church, you have to pass by that Cadillac. What does it say here? They are of the world. What are they looking for? They're looking for worldly things. You see, that's the world. That's the false prophets. So now, and by the way, 
coming back to that. That's First John 4 verse 5. That, the previous chapter was talking about the true prophets, right? Having indwelling Christ. So now we have the worldly ones. Isaiah 30 verse 10 to 11, another one here. It says, which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. You know, preach something to us that we, un we enjoy hearing. I remember visiting a church. I hadn't been to that church for a long time. And I went to visit and I noticed one sister was missing. I said, what happened to her? Oh, well, she didn't come to church anymore. Oh, well, I should go visit her. So I went and I visited her and I sat down with her and her husband and I said, how are you today? We had a nice, pleasant time. And I said, I noticed that you're not coming to church anymore. She said, oh, I'll never go back to that church again. No, I'm not. that's it. I'm finished with that church. But really, why is it that you don't want to go to church anymore? Because every time I go there, they make me feel like I'm a sinner. And you know, now I'm going to church, I feel really comfortable. It's a very nice Sabbath when I go. Everything's beautiful. I said, well, praise the Lord. I said, what do you mean praise the Lord? Must be doing the right job. You see, because here, if we're prophesying smooth things and deceits and everything else, then we're the false prophets. If we're going to be true, what are we going to do? We're going to preach the truth as it is. It's cutting to the heart. That's what the truth is. And false prophets cater towards worldliness. Uh, anyone who ever reads a few pages, all you got to do is read a few pages of Sister White's writings and you're going to see very clearly it starts cutting. I remember going through the nine volume passage for the church and sometimes I'm reading through it and then it's like, wow. I mean, I'm really happy we're reading this because it's describing my wife's situation just so perfectly. I'm really happy that this is really good. I mean, I'm glad. I'm not going to say anything but she really needs this thing. And Oh, oh well, um, mm. Next page is, oh, well, I think this is about me. <laughs> right, isn't it? Isn't that what happens? It cuts you right down to the heart. And what happens to most people? They say, oh, I don't want to read it anymore. But do you want to be saved or not? Do you need a little bit of cutting? You know, I remember many years ago, I was living in Rio, California. I was a little kid back then, a teenager. And uh, actually, it was younger because at 12 years old, sorry, 12 years old, we moved to the other farm. So this is before I was 12, not even a teenager yet. And we had a four-acre farm there. And my dad built a wooden bridge uh, across the little gully that goes onto the main road. And I had my bicycle there, and I was riding my bike home. It's a couple miles away from there. And I got onto that bicycle. It was dark time already. And I'm riding my bicycle over there, you know. And I was turning onto the main road, and I don't know what happened. But I missed, and I went off the bridge. I mean, it's not a very big bridge. I come on, it's only like this, okay? I'm not talking about the bridge bridge. Look at the little bridge I'm talking about, okay? But I fell off there, you know? And I scraped my ankle. And quickly, it's bleeding. My ankle's bleeding. So quickly, we put bandages on there and everything else, you know, and put the, the bicycle in the truck, and I went home all upset and everything else, you know? And shortly after that, it healed up and everything was fine. We're so happy because it's healed. Anyway, a couple months later, I'm looking at my ankle. I'm starting to have a hard time walking. And there's a big bruise on that ankle. So big and so painful, I could not walk anymore. My um, cousins, I think, were visiting at that time. And um, uh, so we had a, um, a, fruit, a stand, vegetable stand in the front of the house. So my dad says, you can't walk, you're still going to work. So you have to go out there and sell at least. So they'd bring me these big tubs of hot water and uh, Epsom salts in there, and I put my feet in there and everything. I was just sitting there, you know. And after a while, I looked, this, this big bruise is starting to break open. And all of a sudden, it broke open, and I started looking at that thing, and man, I said, wow, my bone is all rotten. The, the whole thing there, it was, it was brown, it was uh, falling apart, and I began pulling out my bone, you know. I said, wow, this is horrible, you know. And I pulled it out, and... And I found my bone on the other side. I said, what is this? It's a piece of the bridge. <laughs> I pulled it out. You see, we tried to bandage it up. Instead, we needed what? First cutting, pulling it out. Then it would heal properly. 
And what happens in our spiritual life, we like to cover things over quickly. Instead of cutting deep. Open it up. Pull that rubbish out. Clean it up. Imagine if I bandaged it up again without digging in. What would have happened? Well, even worse, because it could corrode, corrode now. And I mean, it was getting, and this stuff was already, you know, disintegrating, okay? <laughs> Imagine that in my body for the rest of my life. We need the cutting. And so, when you read the testimony and it's cutting to your heart, praise the Lord, accept the cutting. We need it in our souls. Instead of trying to bandage everything, oh, everyone's just good. So, better move on. Got a few, more, two more here to cover for tonight. How do prophets have to do their work? This is not a very long one here. James 5, verse 10. Prophets always had a difficult time. It says, take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. So every single prophet, what did they do? They had to experience suffering. Even David was a prophet, right? Now what did he have to do? How many years he had to live in the wilderness? Running away from Saul. Why? Because in order to do your work properly, we need what? Suffering and cutting. Yeah, we need some cutting ourselves. And when David got to be a king and everything was doing everything well, then what happened? He needed to go back out in the wilderness again for a while. As a king, remember Absalom? What did he do? He had to go out in the wilderness. Why? Because we need some more cutting. Do we need some more cutting today? Do you and I need cutting? Well, we have a choice. Either we're going to get cut down by circumstances, or we're going to read the Spirit of Prophecy, recognize it, and accept the cutting as it comes to our heart. Now, why did they have to have so much patience? Why did these prophets have to suffer so much? What was the biggest problem? Jeremiah 23, 15, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, that make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not of the mouth of the Lord. The problem is because you have so many false prophets. Yeah. You have a true prophet raise up and another a whole bunch of false ones comes. When Jesus came in this room, what happened? Not only was he the Christ, but what else? A whole bunch of false Christ showed up. You know, all this time before that, there's no false Christ. Now all of a sudden, false Christ propping up everywhere. Hey, that's what happened. So false prophets do the same thing. And they make the work of prophets much harder. Now, how do false prophets try to make people feel comfortable? Jeremiah 23, 17. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, Ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his heart, No evil shall come upon you. Oh, you want peace? Well, you're going to have good peace. And what do we like? We like that. You see, we like it when somebody comes to us and says, Oh, you're such a good person, isn't it? And sometimes people even come to you and they say, oh, did, did I do this so bad? I, I did it really bad, you know, and everything else. So when you tell them, yeah, I agree, they get offended. <laughs> Why? Because they're expecting you to say, oh, no, it was just really good, you know. That's what we want naturally. But that's not what we need. We need a little bit of cutting. And if you don't want to cut it by yourself, by studying the spirit of prophecy, then you're going to get cut another way. I'd rather do it with the spirit of prophecy, by the way. You know, quietly in your own home, reading it there, and it's got hard and everything else. Yeah, that's me, and Lord, please forgive me. And, and I'd rather deal with it there. And God wants all of us to deal with it there. And especially tomorrow evening, the last study, we're going to deal a little bit more on that subject. Now, as we examine many of the Bible prophets, one of the traits that they often had was in dealing with reproving. And uh, sometimes in reproving, they ended up uh, getting reproved right back. Notice here in 1 Kings 18, 17, and 18, it says, And it came to pass that Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Remember that? Yeah, Ahab meets Elijah. Oh, you're the troubler. You're the one that's giving all the trouble to Israel. If it wasn't for you, everything would be nice and peaceful. We have, you know, we have all these other prophets that are so nice to us and everything else, and you, one by yourself, is giving us all this trouble. And Elijah, what does he say? Oh, I'm sorry, I wish I could say it differently, and I'll be a little bit more, uh, we need to have more tact and tell you a little bit nicer. Is that what he said? No, what did he say? He said, very bold, he says, and he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord your God and has followed Balaam. In other words, he was very specific. He didn't say, you're the bad guy. No, he didn't say that. He said, you have disregarded the commandments of God. Remember, the very first test of the prophet was the commandment keeping. Remember that? You see, all the way through, we find the commandment keeping is so important. 
as we examine the writings of Ellen G. White, we can clearly see that we are not left in a lackadaisical attitude to sit back and relax. No, it is cutting. And especially as we read the testimonies for the church. What amazes me today is so many people say, we are the remnant church. We are this, we are that, we are the other. And then, oh, how are you the remnant church? We have the testimonies. Well, do you read the testimonies for the church? Yeah, it's written for what? It's for the church. So who reads it? The church. If you're not reading it, you aren't the church. <laughs> so what would be with, what do we need to be doing? Start reading it. And I tell you, it really changed my life. It changed our family. When we started, when we got married, I tell you, it one does wonders in marriage. Because, you know, you get two stubborn people getting married. I mean, every one of them are stubborn. They all, everyone thinks we're just perfect. But, you know, two people get married. they got their own lifestyle, their own ways, everything else, how you do everything. They mingle together. And you got two stubborn people getting married. That's a life. That's a fact of life. Okay? Now, what happens? How do you manage two individuals to become one? Quite simple. It's called the spirit of prophecy. Absolutely wonderful. We began with reading the Bible along with the Conflict of the Ages series. Reading them together because they kind of go along. When we finished the Conflict of the Ages series, but then, but then we had a kid, so we ended up reading Adventist Home and a few child guidance and a few things. But you know, we, we have to get back to something important. And one day we said, you know what? Let's start with the nine volumes. So whenever I was home, for worship, guess what we did? For worship, we would read the nine volumes. Testing for the church. Man, it's a lifesaver. Changes people's lives. If you haven't done it, try it. It's going to change your life experience. And number five... What do we have to carefully evaluate in the life of an individual who is supposed to be a prophet? Matthew 7, 15 to 20 is very specific. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. It's by the fruit, by their life. One of the things this verse shows clearly is that there's going to be prophets till the end. Why? Because you've got to be testing them all the time. If there were no more prophets after the Bible, he would say, don't bother testing. They're all false. Right? But when he says, test the prophets, that means that there are true prophets. Now, what fruits are we looking for? In Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about the fruits that need to be experienced the purpose of prophets. Ephesians 4, first of all, verse 8, and then 11 to 16. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So these are some of the gifts that God has in the church. And we recognize them, right? And what are all these supposed to do, including prophets? What are they supposed to be doing? What is their purpose in the church? Notice verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, the purpose of all these gifts is to bring about unity, not division. But unity on the truth, not unity just in the building. You can, gather a, you can get a thousands of people at a football stadium. They seem pretty united, don't they? But that's not talking about that type of unity, is it? It's talking about unity in the truth. And verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together 
and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Every one of us are needed, because that's how the joints compact, because of every one of us. But the whole purpose of this is to edify the body and to bring it into unity. When we study the writings of Sister White, we find that her purpose of writing was to bring about unity. For example, volume 5, page 47 to 48. A union of believers with Christ will as a natural result lead to union with one another. Which bond of union is the most enduring upon earth? We are one in Christ as Christ is one with the Father. You notice, if you love Jesus Christ, and I love Jesus Christ, no one can separate us. Simple. That is how unity is brought in. When there's division, it means one of us or both of us are in trouble. That's what it means. So if we're not united, then we need to start evaluating why are we not united. Because unity is the result of being one with Christ. A union of believers with Christ will naturally... We don't have to say, you have to unite. No. We don't have to force unity. It doesn't have to do it. Why? If we're united with Christ, it, the natural result is union with one another. Christians are branches and only branches in the living vine. One branch is not to borrow its sustenance from another. Our life must come from the parent vine. It is only by personal union with Christ, by communion with Him daily, hourly, that we can bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, our union is not with each other mainly, but union with what? The parent stock which is Jesus Christ. But then if I'm united to the parent stock Jesus Christ and you're right next to their united, guess what? That's one. You can't be somewhere else over there because the parent stock is in one place. It brings us together. Look at this beautiful one here. Sanctified Life, page 85. I love this statement here. Unity is the sure result of Christian perfection. That means the more and more we become perfected in our character, we become what? United with each other. One more statement here. Volume 4. And sometimes we misunderstand the whole work of the church. How many times do you say, oh, we can't do anything because there's no preacher here. We need a preacher to preach for us. And you know what it says here? Preaching is the largest part of the work to be done. No, no. Oh, you don't like this? Oh, it's not, not, not preaching. Oh, preaching is what? A small part of the work to be done for the salvation of souls. That's only the small part. God's Spirit convicts sinners of the truth and He places them in the arms of the church. The ministers may do their part, but they can never perform the work that the church should do. So we may go preach, we may go give Bible studies, and then what does God do? He takes that soul and places them where? Not in my arms. Man, that's not my business. Where does he? He places them in the arms of the church. And the church's responsibility now is to nurture. And if it, it says he places them in the arms of the church, that means what is that person? A little baby, you see. And the church now needs to nurture that little baby. That's not the job of the preachers. And we often mistake that. And that's how we think, oh, we have nothing to do. We need a preacher. The preacher is doing everything. No. It's only when the church becomes united. And I've had a chance to witness this from time to time. Where the church was really united and then we had so many people coming and all we know is people want to get baptized. And really get converted. It was awesome to watch this. And it wasn't us. It was a few of us doing something. But the church was working. And that church was, it was absolutely, it was wonderful growing. Can you imagine a church of about 500 people? Because uh, when Jesus ascended, there was about 500 people. 500 people were looking at Jesus going up into heaven, right? There was 120 evangelists and all that in the upper room, but the whole church was about 500. Can you imagine in one day, from 500, they grew up to 3,500? What would we do if we grew, what, six, seven times all of a sudden like this? Would we know what to do with all that? If the church is not working, we are not going to be able to handle it because those 12 apostles couldn't handle that growth. Sorry, they couldn't do it. It wasn't that. It was placed in the arms of a church that was ready to nurture those 3,000 people. In conclusion, 
as we'll do the two tomorrow morning. Many people, as they read any of the books of Sister White, I keep hearing this over and over again. And this is, you know, you give them steps to Christ, you give them desire of ages, something, great controversy, whatever. And they say, wow, it seems like her writings are inspired. I don't know if you heard that before, but I've heard it. Oh, it seems like this person here was inspired. Where did you get this book? Well, yeah, I've never seen anything like this. And it's very true. So as we consider some of the facts, we are urged to follow the example of King Jehoshaphat. And it's really important for us to think about King Jehoshaphat. And uh, I want you to think there was this big army that came against the uh, kingdom of Judah. Jehoshaphat went and took the letter to the temple. He prayed to God. And finally he had enough courage. And he, read the whole chapter 20. It's really wonderful to look at that prayer. And uh, Jehoshaphat comes out. And uh, uh, he, make, he tells this to the people, and we'll read this in a moment. And right after that, the entire army of Judah goes out to war against this humongous army. Huge army that they have, they have to face. And there's this little group of people going out. And you know, you have to put the best fighters on the front line, right? So they put the best ones on the front line. Do you know who they were on the front line were? The choir. Can you believe that? Yeah, after, after this, they, they were so confident in victory, they, on the front line, they put the choir. And they went out, and the soldiers were in the back. Choir in the front, they go up there, and they get over the hill, and they see all a bunch of dead bodies. They killed each other already. That's how God works. How did that happen? Notice Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. King Jehoshaphat encouraged them with something. He says, And they rose up early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe in His prophets, so shall ye prosper. Do you want to prosper today? Are you interested in prosperity? Then believe His prophets. God has given us something wonderful today. And it depends with each one of us what are we going to do with it. Are we going to take it to heart? Or are we going to just read it and say, oh, that's for somebody else? Or are we going to have it cut to the core so we can get that rubbish out of our ankle? Remember that? Get that out completely. Get all that rubbish out. Clean it all out. Uh, and then what? Then the healing process can begin and we can spend eternity with Jesus Christ. May the Lord help us that we may be among those people. Amen.